This is The Crucible. The JRTC Experience. Good afternoon from the State Department's Brussels Media. Greetings from the U.S. Department of State's Asia Pacific Media. Today we are very pleased to be joined. Often in remote or challenging locations, these elections are an inspiring example. Good afternoon from the State Department's Brussels Media. Good afternoon Brussels to everyone. Media. I welcome our participants logging in. To play a critical role in advancing prosperity, democracy, and stability across the Indo Pacific. This is where we discuss war fighting skills and lessons learned in a decisive action training environment for large scale combat operations at JRTC. Hi, I'm Colonel Matt Hardman, the Commander of Operations Group here at the Joint Readiness Training Center. And thanks for joining us for another episode of the Crucible Experience, uh, the JRTC Experience. Um, we're joined by a special guest today. Yeah, thank you for having me, sir. I'm uh, Captain Will Happel from the Princess of Wales' Royal Regiment. I'm the British Exchange Officer here at uh, JRTC. And, uh, you know, fortunate to have him here, uh, Infantry Officer. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so um, I, I consider myself very fortunate to be here as well, sir. Um, I've really enjoyed my time here. I have, a, I have developed recently a bit of a background in collective training. I spent two years at the Combat Ready Training Center in the UK doing uh, light and light mech uh, collective training events before then coming out here um, to continue doing rotations uh, in the box. Okay, and then you know we're losing you. Yeah. Uh, you're off to Fort Leavenworth, right? That's correct, sir. And yeah. So there's yeah. some lucky staff group that's getting Will here uh, in their group. Um, and so uh, as, as some of you that know me out there know, I'm a giant nerd, and uh, Will and I got to talking about books. And so he brought uh, one of my uh, favorite books uh, for our profession, Three Commando Brigade in the Falklands, No Picnic, uh, by uh, General Julian uh, Thompson. Um, and so, you know, the Falklands uh, campaign and experience, uh, you know, part of why I find this book really interesting, and I read this book uh, before I took over as a brigade trainer at the National Training Center, uh, was looking for something that would help me get my head around uh, brigade operations uh, and large-scale combat operations. Um, and what really stood out to me is, one, uh, you know, the, the British experience in the Falklands is inherently expeditionary. I think it's uh, 8,000 miles away from home. That sounds about right. It's, it's pretty far. I don't know if it's that far, but 8, it's thousands. Kilometers, it's thousands, yeah. Uh, metric. Uh, it's austere. Um, so they're down there in what would be the winter in the southern yeah. hemisphere. Um, and it's, you know, the Argentine uh, military uh, near peer competitor uh, yep. when we look at the capabilities, night vision equipment. Yep. Uh, air defense systems, uh, air really at the beginning of the campaign, air superiority, yeah. um, you know, and a tough, well-trained adversary uh, down there. Um, and so from your perspective, you know, tell me about uh, the Falklands campaign and, and sort of the memory of the British Army. Yeah, I will do. So I, I have to be a little bit careful because uh, I personally have never been to the Falklands and quite a lot of people in the UK military have. So I've not seen the ground for myself. I also come from a regiment uh, where our forebears missed out on going to the Falklands. So we had a battalion that was in Northern Ireland at the time uh, and a battalion that went to Northern Ireland shortly after uh, the Falklands. So uh, I don't have that same deeply ingrained uh, regimental memory of the Falklands. And there are the regiments that went there, it's still very, very much a part of their identity today. It's still referenced very regularly throughout training. So most of our infantry training courses have a real Falklands flavor to them. Their night attacks, uphills, uh, in the rain, generally uh, quite cold uh, weather against a tenacious, well dug in enemy. So it's, it's still very much at the forefront of the uh, sort of psyche, certainly in the, the regiments that, that have that in the history. Yeah, and, and for, the, for the U.S. light infantry community in particular, I mean, even, even with uh, all the experiences in Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, you know, the, the, the experience in, in Mogadishu in 1993 um, with the Ranger Regiment still, you know, has this uh, undercurrent of the, the way we approach a lot of things and deeply ingrained lessons learned from that experience. Um, yeah. And, you know, different but similar, I think, I think the, you know, my, my reading of the history is, is that's very much the case in the British military. Yeah, I, th I think it, it certainly is so. And I think if I could paint a picture for, uh, what the campaign was like, maybe a bit uh, from the ground perspective and, and naval as well. It's personal because today we're recording on the 26th of May, 
So on this day 41 years ago, the campaign was ongoing. Three commando brigade have landed a few days prior, um, and they're just stepping off. So two para battle group are, uh, they're conducting their prelim moves down towards Goose Green. They've come down off of Sussex Mountain, heading southeast to uh, Camilla House. Uh, three para are heading up towards um, Teal Inlet Settlement, and 45 commando are starting their yomp east. So the ground force it's is a yomp. yomp. That's a marine term what, for what's March. It, what's yeah. It March. Yeah, March. We would call it tabbing, tactical advanced battle. Ta ta Tab. Yeah. Tactical advanced battle. Two battle, yes. And, yeah. we, and two battle. Yeah. And we would call it rucking. Yep. Um, yeah, yomping, and, rucking, tabbing. Yeah. yeah, all underneath the green tick. And the green tick being, you know, the the Bergen in, uh, in yep. British parlay. Yep. Uh, the rucksack and you know the green tick because it's sucking the life out of yeah. you as you carry it. And so, um, you know, one of the things that stands out is the the intense loads. Yes. Uh, that 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 folks are under. Eighty pounds is what they quote in here, roughly per person. But the ground is pretty unforgiving. You've got uh, uh, boggy ground, so swampy. Uh, mushy ground that they're sort of wading through and then you've got these uh, rock rivers as I say I've never seen it but I have seen pictures of it and it yeah. if you imagine a river but it's made of boulders that are three feet in diameter six feet in diameter you're having to navigate that with heavy loads um, so so it looks good because the the brigade have landed so far they've got most of their combat power ashore and they're now stepping off on the advance but the wider campaigns actually looking pretty negative at this point so uh, the day before, HMS Coventry has been sunk and destroyed. Uh, Atlantic Conveyor has been destroyed along with all of the helicopters bar one. Right. Um, and then two days prior, HMS Antelope was hit by an exit and exploded. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll back up. So, you know, the, the, the British military, this is organized as a, what we would call today, you know, a joint forcible entry. Yep. Um, and, you know, the the Argentine Air Force is operating uh, from the mainland, so interior lines of communication. Some uh, Argentine Air Force and, and naval aviation operating uh, from the, the islands themselves. Yep. Um, pretty quick outload for most units uh, from the UK. Stop in Ascension uh, Island, um, reconfigure some loads, a little bit of light training, and yep. then off they go uh, down to the Falklands. And so the original, uh, you know, this book does a great job of laying it out. The original plan is we're going to seize uh, a foothold on the west side of the Falklands at San Carlos and then, you know, expand the lodgement and then air assault uh, to see Stanley. Yep. And as you point out, with the loss of the Atlantic conveyor, um, we don't have any helicopters. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we've all been there as infantiers where you're told the helicopter's coming and it doesn't, or the truck is coming and it doesn't. I think that's a good lesson from this yeah. book. Is well, it's the Mike Tyson lesson. Everybody's yeah. got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. That's exactly it, sir, yeah. Right. And that one Chinook, interestingly, uh, it was designation or designated Bravo November. It then fought through uh, both the Iraq and Afghan conflicts. It's had four pilots win distinguished flying crosses in that wow. chassis. It's now on display in RAF Museum Cosford, I think it is. Yeah, so it's had a, a good career. Yeah, and really, you know, with the helicopters that, that the, the British military has left, pretty much per, devoted solely at this point to, to move in artillery, yeah. ammunition, and casualties. Yeah, and that, uh, that was something that really stood out for me in this book was the, the amount of time they spend agonizing over the movement of guns and gun ammunition. It's made me realize as an infantry commander, if you've got what you've got to move yourself, don't expect brigade to be giving you any assets because I can guarantee you it's moving artillery ammunition or it's moving guns. So if you're sat around waiting for a truck yeah. uh, from brigade, you best get walking. And so, um, you know, I, I love this, um, you know, campaign. And, and I've, I've, re I've read this book a couple times. Uh, and, and you've got some other ones here. And I've, I've read a series of books on this. I mean, fascinating to me um, professionally because of the challenges uh, that that three commando is placed in um, you know as you point out at the beginning of the campaign uh, the, the, the British uh, military has not uh, achieved air uh, superiority uh, let alone dominance uh, over the area of operations um, the the Argentine uh, aviation elements are being pretty effective 
at, at getting inside uh, the bubble, um, which has resulted in having to move ships at night away yep. from uh, the, the, the lodgement, so that it slows down the sustainment. Um, and so, you know, for, for somebody that spent a fair bit of time in the airborne community, it, it's not hard to think about an airhead in the same way that, based on windows, may not be able to air land aircraft and so this projected flow of combat power um, you know may not be what we think and so what you know what stood out to you in terms of some of the challenges that they had with building combat power in the lodge yeah so i think um some of the some of the challenges they certainly or uh, brigadier thompson certainly pointed out in the start of his book was really um getting those people ashore under the blankets of uh, air defense and doing so at night um, preferably or in bad weather which was uh, frequent but probably not as frequent as they would have liked um, and then really their air defense until they could get those um, Royal Artillery air defense batteries online which he talks about at length in here the placement of them and how temperamental they could be um, with their placement because again they could only move them by helicopter of which they didn't have many um, their air defense was really just small arms and it was everyone in the brigade who had a machine gun firing up at the aircraft, which by their account seemed to seem to work better than I'd have perhaps expected. But. Um, and, and then, you know, one of the things I remember from reading the book is, you know, some of the challenges they had with the pack out. And so as they loaded ships, there were, there were items of equipment uh, that had gone in first, which means they're coming in l out last, and so that really, you know, the tactical crossload of equipment yep. um, done in haste, in including units that didn't habitually move by ship, to include the, the para uh, units, um, you know, resulted in some surprises when they finally got to the lodgement. Uh, one being tentage for for the uh, the hospital, the roll yep. two. Yeah, and also the. Uh the main headquarters, they agonized over where they were going to put it, whether they were going to keep it on the ship or whether they were going to put it on land. And it's, it's a really interesting sort of internal monologue he's having in the book where he's talking about his thought process about sighting of the headquarters. Um, I think it paid off. It's not, there's very rarely a right or wrong answer. The proof is less, in the pudding. And less bad choices yeah. <laughs> this is really what he yeah. has. And I think also it's that there's an element of, uh, this was a force that was pulled together for this operation and put onto ships, and they just made it work. But it's, you've got to keep, you've got to keep that attitude. That I think is one of the most marvelous things about working in the military is you're surrounded by people who just get things done. Nothing, nothing's ideal, but we just moan about it, of course. But we kind of accept it and just do the best we can. These ships were overloaded with people. The uh, one of his staff officers, Major Ewan Sudby Taylor, was living in a, a toilet for the voyage, because there just weren't enough berths for, for everyone on board. So people had to put up with some pretty rough conditions yeah. and to I, make it work. You know, I, I think one of the other things that's really relevant um, as well is, uh, as, as, as our militaries think about large-scale combat operations, is it's joint. Uh, the, whole, the whole thing is joint. I mean, we have, we have uh, Royal Air Force Harriers flying off of carrier decks, obviously the Royal Navy, uh, the commandos, uh, different army elements here, and there's friction. Um, but you know, to your point, is there's a bias to action, and people, you know, quickly yeah. work to solve the problems. Yeah, it's a real team effort. Every service is climbing over each other to try and <laughs> prove that what they're doing is is of good value and uh, having a significant impact on the campaign. Um, and so, you know, they get this lodgement, you know, very obviously concerned uh, about securing the lodgement initially, you know, first from counterattack. Um, and they use, uh, the British use some special operations forces, uh, one to fix units and then two to, to really create deception, uh, to create space. Um, the landing goes better than they s expect. Mm -hmm. um, although there are frequent air attacks um, they're able to get the bulk of the forces landed. Um, and, and the real challenge becomes building the other parts of combat power, the, the, not the pointy end, but, but munitions, um, sustainment, yeah. uh, and, and expanding C2 capacity. Yeah. I think the, um, the way in which special forces are used 
is very interesting because it's not a way in which we would be used to in recent times. In, in this, the, the special forces were orbited within the brigade and were working to the, the commando brigade. So they were supporting, in some ways, the other maneuver forces um, and going and doing the usual sorts of things they do, long patrols, uh, deception operations, raids, uh, but really having a, a massive impact and buying a lot of space and time for the, uh, the main body to inload, sort themselves out, and then get on the march. And so they get the lodgement, they get the, uh, the uh, ADA systems in imperfectly, uh, but ultimately in, and then, and then they look you know, to expand this lodgement. And so you know, the, there's a realization that it's all going to go slower than we thought because we don't have helicopters. Mm -hmm. or we don't have the, the number of helicopters that we thought we'd have. And, and we still haven't gained air, air superiority. And so we, we you know, results in a, an operation uh, down at Goose Green uh, to the, to really to the southeast of, of San Carlos. And you know, what are some of the lessons that came out of, of the, the fight from Tupara down to, to the Falklands? And I was fortunate I got to do a regimental exchange with Tupara back in the, in the early 2000s. So oh, great. Great outfit. Yeah, oh, the, well, they still have. Uh, I've seen them come through on exercises um, uh, back in the UK before, in my, my previous job, and they're still a very, a very good outfit. Um, still very up for it, busy all the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the, the other book, uh, that I would recommend that talks specifically about Goose Green and some of the lessons learned is uh, not mentioned in dispatches uh, by Spencer Fitzgibbon. Um, it, it shows uh, some of the other side of, of Goose Green. There were BBC correspondents, and he, he argues that they overinflated the victory. But if you remember, the war's not going well at this point. Right. Brigadier Thompson is under a lot of pressure to get some sort of land victory so that they can announce it in Whitehall. Uh, and announce it in Parliament and say, um, say that things are going well. But you know, tactically, um, I mean, it's a tough. You know, setting aside the operational and policy. Yep. You know, tactically, uh, there's an airfield down there. Uh, a number of ADA units and ground units um, probably outnumber uh, two pair at two to one. Um, really open terrain. I mean, this is uh, treeless terrain, um, you know, and they, they, they tab down there, um, pretty long movement, horrible weather. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the commander, Lieutenant Colonel Jones, H. Jones, uh, they, they log her up for a night, and, and he, he makes it, they put security out, but he makes the decision at some risk to put people under cover uh, to preserve combat power. Um, and, and then when they attack, you know, the, the really limiting factors is the amount of mortar ammunition they have, and uh, there's a controlled supply rate of, of how much artillery support they'll have. Yes. Which is something in training we often don't think about. Yep. Um, that, that we're not going to have these endless supplies of, of ammunition. Um, and well, so, yeah. What they, well, they had a naval gunfire and support, which is probably every... Uh, Infantry officer or artillery officer's dream to one day call in yeah. naval gunfire in well, anger. I, but, not uh, mine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so HMS Arrow was in support, but they were having they were having problems with that because it's probably the first time that they've really ever executed naval gunfire uh, fr from a ground ground observer from the Royal Artillery. Well, and they stay closer and longer than they were supposed to uh, because the fight is so hard. Yeah. Um, and they stay on station at, at pretty tremendous risk yeah. because of the, the lethality of the Argentine air attacks at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that, if, if memory serves, they have a, a stoppage on the gun. Yep. Um, and so, you know, the two para gets held up. I mean, the, the Argentines had prepared positions, wire mines, um, uh, 50 caliber machine guns well sighted in. Um, you know, and this, this turns into the classic uh, infantry battalion attack. Yeah. Um, and so what, yeah, what are some of the things that come out of that fight? Well, it, it's interesting look at the, uh, their approaches to it. And I think they started with a very, very deliberate attack. Um, and then it became apparent that the enemy template that they had planned off probably wasn't quite matched up with um, what, what it really was. And then they changed their approach partway through to more of a movement to contact 
battle drill and they start to make a lot more progress. They also, at the tactical level, start to change their TTPs because they're coming up against these bunkers and they find that firing small arms at the bunkers isn't, isn't doing the trick. So they then start firing Carl Gustav and Milan into the bunkers. And after they've done that a few times, uh, it really has a, a big impact on the enemy's um, uh, will to fight. Right. Um, once they've seen a few of their bunkers explode with uh, shoulder launch munitions, that, that has a greater effect than perhaps what they would have done normally. And, and this is you know, one of the, um, you know, the, the British Army uh, hadn't fought large-scale combat at this point in 30 years, right, since the Korean campaign. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, this is 30 years. And so it's easy for us to, um, to imagine ourselves really in some respects in the same position of, um, you know, as professional soldiers, uh, you know, n nobody of our generation has experienced large-scale combat operations. Um, and so, you know, the lessons learned from these things is it's unfortunately, like, like many of us, you know, it's the relearning of hard lessons from, from previous campaigns. Yeah. The HE wins a battlefield. And, that, and that, that's one of those that lessons that stands out from, from this campaign um, that we see every month here. Uh, yep. in rotation. It's units learn that it, they got to lead with high explosive. Yes. Yeah, you have to use high explosives. You have to dig. They mention that in this book. They probably mention it in every other modern warfare book. You've got, you've got to dig. When you stop, if you're static for a long time, you've got to dig. Put yourself on a reverse slope, get eyes on the forward slope, and then, and then dig. dig. Yeah. And so, you know, the goose green fight, um, you know, as you describe it, it, you know, which really end up at small unit level of, you know, section leaders, platoon leaders, company commanders, uh, maneuvering formations to get HE in position, to have a, a decisive impact, and then exploit uh, that gap. And really, once uh, they're able to do that a couple times, uh, in conjunction with indirect fire, they, the British get in a position of advantage that really make, it's a fait accompli to the Argentine uh, forces on the ground. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, in, re in relatively quick order, kind of causes a cessation of activities and, and then the Argentine uh, units on the ground surrender. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some other things that stand out that, I, you know, the, is the, the casualty evacuation uh, component of this and, and the hard choices that are being made on the ground and the, the uh, the importance of being able to treat and stabilize casualties on scene. And unfortunately, uh, you know, Colonel Jones is killed in this fight. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that, that stands out when I read this as well, is for the young soldiers, the, 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 the sheer violence of what they've just experienced. Yeah. Um, you know, different than um, the stability operations that the British, you know, had, had been doing in other places in the world at the time. This is jarring of just how violent large-scale combat is against yeah. a near-peer adversary. Yeah, you, you get a flavor of it um, from this, because the way he narrates it, it's, it's first person as if he was within the, the battle group at the time. Um, but there is a BBC documentary that came out within the last two years where they interview some of the people who were there, and they paint a very vivid picture of the realities of war and what it was like to uh, attack through down into Goose Green. It's quite... And this, um, you know, how long does the the action at Goose Green take? I mean, this is a, this is almost, a, if memory serves from reading, it, it's a twelve to eighteen hour fight. That sounds about right. I'd have to double check, it, but it's, I think it is more than twelve hours, and I think it was delayed about twenty four hours as well because of how long it took them to get from Sussex Mountain to um, Goose Green. So that. These guys had been on the march, living out of their rucks for several days, no sleep, in very, very cold. <laughs> yeah, very cold, wet, wet feet. Um, they, they, in the documentary, one of the people who was there says that he stepped off of the landing craft into the water, and that was the last time he had dry feet for the whole campaign. And then so from this campaign, uh, or this fight, um, the, the rest of the brigade continues the fight east uh, towards Port Stanley on, on the east side of, of uh, the island. And, it, and there's really a ring uh, around Stanley of, of mountains. Yeah. 
Um, and so, you know, for the for the brigade, as their lines extend, they have some real challenges as they think through that. And so, you know, just give us a quick overview of, of how does the, you know, the the design of the campaign at this point to uh, to really invest, Stanley. Well, I, I think what was interesting for me at this point was that yeah. uh, uh, Brigadier Thompson is controlling the tempo uh, by slowing the battalions down at points because he, as we mentioned, he's he's focusing on getting this artillery ammunition forwards, moving the guns. So it all has to be a very deliberate process, which was interesting to me because I always thought you would be trying to drive your subordinates forward at that level, but actually uh, he's often holding them back. But once they manage to get a process going that's almost like a drill where they're uh, moving the, uh, the guns forward and the ammo forward and the helicopters there, they're then able to free up some of the helicopters to help carry rucks and people at points to, to get them further forward. Um, and then they get towards the high features which are to the west of uh, Port Stanley and that's when they, they start to formulate their plan for attack. Um, you've got the 5th Infantry Brigade that have landed at this point as well um, and they're involved and it's quite interesting how during this uh, phase of the campaign they're able to reorbit within those two brigades and they, they pass uh, one of the battalions to the other brigade and then they get that battalion back later on. The apparent ease with which they do that in this book I think is quite telling because I think that's a, a, having seen people do similar things at a lower level, I think that's an incredibly complicated uh, thing to do to retask all like that. In, um, especially without roads and helicopters. Yeah. Um, you know, very, I mean, the, you know, I, your description, yeah, that's what stands out to me is to the degree at which, um, you know, General Thompson exerts a, f a substantial amount of control over the battalions. And what we end up with is a, a series of sequential battalion actions. Now, we've gained contact uh, through patrols and with observation and indirect fire. Of, of really all of the, the Argentine uh, defense that's arrayed around uh, Port Stanley, um, but very deliberately does it uh, sequentially, precisely to manage uh, the guns mm -hmm. and to be able to provide support, which looks a lot like what our live fire up at Pisan looks like, a series yeah. of battalion attacks that are integrated and synchronized but requires the choreography from the brigade to maximize uh, fires. Yeah, and he's he's forever flying or walking around the battlefield to meet with his commanders, to get eyes on the enemy position, see his forward positions, uh, that helps shape his decision making throughout. Um, and I, something that I've inferred that isn't necessarily the case, but I like to think it probably is, is that he's he's judging these characters very shrewdly, and he's he's picking his horses for courses throughout so it's, you're gonna have to horses for courses so he's he, he's there's a bit where he talks about the uh the structure of a battalion and, and how it works and how a co is king within the battalion and how his job as uh, brigade commander is to sit over these three families effectively um and they each have their own character yeah. and and their own sort of feel to them and he's got to try and understand what that is. So he knows that this battalion is going to be better at these type of activities than perhaps this one, but this one will be better at those types of activities. So he's, it, it's all, it, he never says it directly, but I think it's implied that he is, he's picking which battalion he's sending onto which objective based on- uh, Unit personality. Yes, the, yeah. the unit personality. And I think there's, there's very much um, you know, different, different commanders and different units are, are Better suited for different problems. Yeah. Um, no, very, very, yeah. That that absolutely. Now that you put it that way, that absolutely stands out. Um, let's, you know, let's talk. You know, so one of the things that's fascinating about this is, you know, the Argentines have very good night vision equipment, uh, heavy machine guns. Um, although you know, m many of the forces are are conscript, um, there there are you know marine units uh, there. I mean. Th this is, uh, and they've had a fair bit of time to prepare, uh, and, and they've dug in, and they, they've put in uh, you know, protective obstacles, they've put in minefields as tactical obstacles and prepared positions. Um, one of the big critiques, um, having read a number of books from the Argentine perspective as well, 
as the British perspective, is really the lack of patrolling uh, from the Argentine units. And this is something that the British do really well. We, you know, as you've kind of read this and gone through it, I mean, how does the patrolling fit into the culture of, of these units? And then and how is that used to the advantage of, of the, the British forces in this fight? Uh, so p patrolling still very much uh, prevalent in the culture of those units and and the wider British Army. But for instance, in the in a para battle group, their recce platoon is referred to as the patrols platoon rather than the recce platoon, which implies a slightly different task. I, I think they're generally used for similar things, but um, that that shows the level of uh, importance that they place on patrolling. Um, and patrolling, I think having read this and also from what I've observed in the last three years working in collective training is, is really what enables people to win. Generally speaking, it's an enabling activity or it's an offensive action. Um, but if you can conduct effective patrolling, you're keeping the enemy at arm's reach and you're collecting information. And that information is what allows you to have a better plan, plan for the fires and then get that HE onto the target so that you can then maneuver effectively uh, unhindered. Um, th there were a couple of occasions where he mentioned there were Argent uh, Argentinian patrols uh, out there as well. And I think um, th they probably had the disadvantage of the fact that uh, uh, defense is very difficult. Yeah. They're, on, they're on mountaintops in freezing cold weather and they've got to defend. I think psychologically that is a much harder activity than having to attack. It's much easier to uh, plan an attack and go out and, and do that than it is to sit static, patrolling day in, day out, not finding anything, but maintaining high levels of discipline. So um, I think the patrolling is very important. And it's something I would, I would certainly take away from this and from the time I've spent here and um, at this, the Combat Ready Training Center is that those, those units that patrol, they detect the enemy earlier. And it's, it's a race to find, really. We're all trying to find, fix, strike, exploit, or whatever framework you use, the first rung on the ladder is find. If I can find you and you can't find me, I've got a much, much better advantage now. Yeah. And, and so, you know, it, for, 41 years removed, you know, now you know, small UAS, uh, more, uh, you know, greater proliferation of signal and electronic warfare detection devices. I mean, the, the ability to sense Mm -hmm. is much greater and, and and there was electronic warfare in, in, in this campaign as well on, on both sides but obviously that's evolved and, and certainly the small UAS I mean the, the ability to sense and see our adversaries uh, is, is only increased it, you know the British do that in this campaign primarily through patrolling uh, dismounted reconnaissance to great effect I mean they're able to identify uh, you know main battle positions and, and what's really key is identify the obstacles Mm -hmm. um, that are in front of them, and so you know, in several instances, they're they're navigating their way through uh, these obstacles, or they're reducing obstacles out of direct fire contact uh, in support of, of future operations. Yeah, finding the minefields and trying to navigate routes through minefields for for battalions. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting interesting part of it. But there are points where they attacked uh, two para again on uh, one of the um, other objectives attacked straight through a minefield. And I think they did so knowingly. Um, and they just they took the, uh, the doctrinal template and knew that they would take X percentage of casualties doing so and just planned accordingly. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure how many casualties they took doing that. But. Yeah, and, and in several instances, they've also task organized sappers with some of these patrols as well uh, to help reduce and mark some of these obstacles. Yeah. Um, you know, the massing of fires in, in the fight for the hills um, is, is pretty important. And, and echelon meant with battalion mortars as well uh, to maintain, because these fights last all night. These are not hour long gunfights. These are, yeah. you know, all night, eight to 10 hour fights um, against an enemy that has, you know, in many instances, alternate and supplementary positions in depth. Yeah. Um, and so this is a, it, which the lessons from Goose Green are past. And again, you know, the British are employing uh, Milan, which is equivalent, similar to a Javelin, yeah. uh, anti-tank munitions to reduce uh, bunkers, uh, laws, um, Carl, obviously Carl Gustav's, and then hand grenades. Uh, but this is a tough, close fight 
uh, that in some instances even results in, in, in the use of bayonets at, at close range. Yeah, and I think the sustainment planning uh, at the battalion level is very interesting, and it comes back to the point we made uh, before about just being being tough as well. Um, they they were having to carry everything, less artillery ammo basically, because that's all of the transport they had was dedicated to artillery movement as a priority. So the mortar ammo was being carried by the rifle companies. So th th these people were having their 80 pounds of kit, and then as they're stepping off through the start line, they're probably being given a couple of belts of machine gun ammunition and a mortar greenie, which is two uh, 81 millimeter uh, mortar bombs. They're then carrying them up to an RV point where they drop them off, which is near one of the mortar firing points where the mortars will set up later on, and then they're doing that leapfrogging from objective to objective. I think you know one of the things um, you know that comes out is uh, so one you know it's it's doable to move long distances under load um, and they do it right they they fight from the west side of the island to the east side of the island two um, it, you know the the leaders on the ground very soberly make choices about okay we have to refit this force we've just moved you know forty kilometers dismounted we have to refit this force rebuild combat power. So there is an acknowledgement that like, after this movement in this terrain, that they have to rebuild combat power to, to be able to, to do the close fight. Um, and then there's a tailoring of, a, of the loads for the assault because everybody realizes we can't do this with 80, we can't attack an 80 pound rucksacks. Yeah. And so there's, it's uh, the, the learning that occurs in the organizations is, uh, you know, stands out in many instances of star majors being like, hey, what are we doing here? Yeah, uh, there, there, there's a point in there where they fly in some rations and uh, the people on the receiving end hadn't eaten in 24 hours. But I think the, the training people get here prepares them well for that kind of austerity. Yeah. Um, so what, um, so kind of what are some of the big lessons what are the big takeaways that you, you took from, from this book and, and the campaign? So that uh, patrolling, which has already been mentioned, is probably the one that stood out for me most. He, uh, he appointed one of his principal staff officers as a patrol master when they got to the uh, eastern side of the island towards Stanley uh, as they were shaping um, or in, in the sort of shaping phases for those high features and every battalion was sending out patrols all the time so the, the place was like an ant colony of, of patrols and that information flow from the sensor which is the people on the patrol back to the battalion where they then mark up their um, overlays and their, their temp, uh, terrain overlays and sit temps and things and then uh, that information then back to the brigade to this patrol master uh, really stood out and I think that that hasn't for me, I don't think that's changed um, for an infantry unit. Uh, the units that patrol aggressively on collective training are the ones that generally have a better time uh, when they encounter the enemy. Um, another uh, standout thing for me was uh, s simplicity. He, he kept the schemes of maneuver generally quite simple. I know we mentioned about uh, retask org of a unit, which they uh, did with apparent ease. But generally, his attacks were not complicated, um, they, or they weren't. Uh, the maneuver plan wasn't wasn't particularly complicated. It was um, preceded by uh, lots of artillery, and then they would attack from what they decided was the most favourable direction based on the terrain and the enemy um, the enemy laydown. But once the attack went, it was it was generally speaking uh, sequential, or at one point. Um, uh, simultaneous two battle groups up, but he always had a reserve. He was always pretty well balanced, um, and he kept it simple. And I think that that's really important as well. There's a there's a temptation uh, I see for people to try and overcomplicate things, to think outside the box. By all means, think outside the box, but keep the plan simple. Because uh, when you come under contact and commanders start dying, you can't you can't manually control what's going on. You need your subordinates to understand the plan to the level that they can just execute it without your input whatsoever. Um, and I think that he, he certainly achieved that. At one of the battalion actions, there's a pretty, it, at the battalion level, there's a pretty complex scheme maneuver um, that the lead company comes in direct fire contact 
or, well, I think it, it, it's initiated by a soldier stepping on a landmine, and then, and the plan's out the door, and we just got to go at the enemy. Uh, you know, so the, the battalion puts mortars, uh, suppresses the mortars, and it, and it really turns into, uh, you know, a, a battalion attack, a penetration, and passing one company after the other mm -hmm. uh, through. Uh, because they're not able to envelop them. I mean, they're able to, the element that comes in direct fire contacts establishes a base of fire, and then it's like, let's just get on with it. Yeah. Um, no, I agree. And it stands out in mean, the simplicity of a lot of HE in a simple uh, scheme maneuver, violently executed, yeah. um, you know, goes a long way. Um, you know, I think the, the privation and hardship of this campaign, um, you know, you, you talked about the, you know, from the Argentine perspective, I mean, at this point in the campaign, they're, they're having a hard time getting resupplied. Um, it had been in position for almost six weeks, uh, horrible weather conditions. Many of those soldiers didn't come with the proper gear, um, you know, weren't, weren't equipped with the proper gear. Um, and then the British walking all across the island, I mean, this is uh, a tough place to fight. Yeah. Uh, privation and hardship are, are absolutely, um, you know, present, omnipresent in this fight, and, and really violent. Yeah, uh, really violent. Well, I, th fight. I think one of the things that stood out for me on that is uh, how he introduces all of his characters, and he talks about uh, who they are and what their role is. But then he always introduces a bit of extracurricular information about them as well, um, and I think that shows that, or, or he's demonstrating a that he knows his people very well and, and knows more than just them professionally, knows them as a, a human being. But also he, he puts stock in, in these, uh, these extracurricular activities. He, he, he considers that the mark of a man rather than just their soldiering ability. So that everyone he mentions is either a rugby player or uh, an Everest uh, mountaineer or an alpinist or a cross-country skier or a cricketer or something like that. And I think it's, uh, for me, I think that just shows the level of importance in having people in your organization that push their envelope of, of comfort on a regular basis. Um, they're adventurous, they're, they're, they're tough, yeah. tough people, generally speaking. They've, you've, you've got to have uh, something other than just your, your profession, I think, yeah. in that sense. You've got to live hard to be hard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I, as you bring that up, I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, the company commanders that I had when I was a battalion commander. You know, uh, one of them was a, a college level football player, like absolute tough as nails. Um, you know, one of them uh, stalked a mountain goat for two days straight in Alaska. Um, you know, and you know, a, another one of them, uh, you know, was a rugby player uh, and, and just kind of put himself through hardship on a regular basis up in the environment in Alaska. And so, you know, there there is this. Um, they're intangibles into what we do, and you know I'm I'm with you. I think it's in encouraging people um, to do difficult things mm -hmm. and, be, and to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think yeah. you know team sports do that for people, um, but you know doing doing tough stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. It's easy to focus just on the the professional output side of it, but um, I think it is important for our people to. to some people need to be pushed. Other people just. They, they do it naturally, but I think we need to encourage and give time for our people to push them out of their comfort zone. Yeah, um, you know, so I, I've got a couple that stand out to me too from this campaign that I think it warrants, um, you know, reflection uh, when we think about large scale combat operations in the modern era. So the first one is, you know, this idea of the transparency of the battlefield, and something that we talk a lot about here at JRTC. And, and, um, you know, the ability to be sensed and then to be uh, attacked with long range fires. Um, the, the brigade command post is attacked by uh, Argentine uh, air. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and the brigade aid station, yeah. uh, the Roll 2, is attacked uh, with Argentine air. Yeah. Um, you know, and the Argentines don't know it's an aid station, it's inside a series of buildings. After that, they, the British paint, I think, the buildings, red crosses on the buildings. Um, but uh, you know, if it was true 41 years ago, it's going to be true today yep. that the, the, our, these uh, sustaining entities and these C2 entities really have to work to be, to one, look unimportant, yeah. <laughs> and two, uh, be agile and mobile. Well, that's the thing. So they set the 
brigade headquarters up first, right next to a flagpole in San Carlos Bay. So there is, there is a natural human uh, tendency to anchor yourself when static. If you answer your phone on the street, you go and stand next to a lamppost or, a, or like move off to the side of the pavements or sidewalk. I, I think that potentially the same is true when you're setting up uh, a static defensive position or a, a main command post. It's, and I have seen it on collective training as well. People will set up the main command post right next to a TRP or a target reference point, so the lone tree on the hill or a radio mast or something like that. They realized they did it. They took the flag down and sawed the flagpole down, but it's just being aware of those sorts of things. And, and, and that wasn't when they weren't at that location when, the, when they got bombed. But it's, sometimes I think we don't help ourselves, and we just need to be more aware and, and do perhaps the unnatural thing when, when sizing some of these yeah, positions. And, and, and I think that's um, you know, part of this is uh, I think it's the value of reading. Right, the, the and study of our profession is that we can learn a lot of these things vicariously mm -hmm. from the experiences of others. Yeah. Um, you know, likewise, I think it's it's you know talking to people that have come through rotations here and okay, what did you experience and learn? Like, let, let's make new and different mistakes. Yes. Um, yeah. you know, not the ones uh, that have been made before us. And, and then the other, um, you know, one of John Thompson's you know big concerns uh, with you know he didn't want to lose anybody in a ship. Um, you know, so it's this big emphasis on, on rapidly transitioning uh, from ship to shore. And I think that, you know, part of a joint forcible entry, whether you're doing it by ship, whether you're doing it by fixed wing, by rotary wing, by vehicle, it doesn't really matter. It's that, that the danger inherent uh, when from transition from movement to maneuver and how vulnerable uh, we potentially are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and when 5th Brigade comes, um, they, they keep people inside a ship, the Sir Galahad, and the Sir Galahad struck by an exoset, tremendous casualties mm -hmm. uh, to the unit, uh, which is, you know, obviously a, a huge tragedy, uh, but is a lesson for all of us that the vulnerability on, on the modern battlefield, the lethality of the modern battlefield to be sensed uh, first and foremost, and then, you know, and then to be struck. And, and even though, you know, at this point, uh, the Argentine military is, um, running out of exosets, uh, the air threat is, is being uh, reduced a little bit by uh, the, the British uh, Royal Navy. Um, Land-based exoset, uh, which they had, they had taken, uh, memory serves, had taken off a ship and repurposed as, Already. A, as, a, as a ground launcher, which <laughs> is this, um, you know, we, we can't underestimate our enemies. I mean, yeah. our enemies, you know, thinking, living, breathing, you know, they're just like us, they love their country. Um, they're gonna. They're also gonna. You know. They're there are, gonna solve problems. There are a lot of uh, a lot of smart people out there. Right. Yeah. And um, you know. And um, you know. This uh, always thinking about the worst case scenario. And in our profession, inherently, you know, small C conservative has to be a conservative mm -hmm. kind of view of okay, what's the hazards and risk out there, and being very clear eyed about the risk that we confront, um, because it, this is a you know, a, a campaign that is incredibly violent. I mean, number of, of ships lost um, on the British side, n num you know, number of ships on the, the Argentine side, and, you know, 100-plus uh, aircraft uh, shot down, hundreds of, of dead, um, many hundreds uh, wounded, uh, life-altering injuries from, for, a pretty, for a pretty small force. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's what commends this campaign to study. It's austere, it's expeditionary, and it's against an adversary, you know, that has a, a lot of capability. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the British are outnumbered yeah. uh, in this. And, uh, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of grit uh, for the British uh, to carry the day. You know, one of my, not from this book, but one of my favorite quotes from the campaign, and it's either from a book or a documentary, is, you know, a, a, a British corporal's ass, like, how did you do it? And he says, well, it's the little things. Yep. You know, it's like, if you're, if you're, if you have a pair of dry socks in your Bergen and your mates got wet feet, you give up your dry socks. It's, it's, you look after your, your mates. Yeah. And, um, you know, reminds me of one of my favorite quotes from, from Command Sergeant Major Hall, the former, uh, Sergeant Major for the Ranger Regiment. You know, the fundamental determinant of success or failure in combat is how a soldier feels about his or her peers and immediate leader. And in all of uh, the, the material I've read 
on, on the Falklands campaign. You know, the commandos and the paras in particular, there is this deep unit cohesion born out of shared hardship and training. Um, you know, the, the commandos had come from training in Norway uh, before uh, this campaign. You know, the, the pair is obviously, you know, jumping out of airplanes and, and hard training and, and the importance of hard training, not only of what it teaches us, mm -hmm. but how it, it, it causes us to, to redefine what our limitations are, but also to kind of bond us together through sh uh, shared hardship. Yeah, I ab absolutely agree. And we, we see it here all the time, uh, people forging those bonds and memories through hardship that they'll probably carry for the rest of their lives. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the little things as well, because I'm, I'm a big advocate of the little things are the things that make the big difference. Some people will win Victoria Crosses or Medals of Honor, um, and they're obviously very highly valued, but the, the soldier that wakes up in the morning and cleans their weapon and makes sure that it works properly, it's, it's the cumulative effect of all of those people that wins the day in the end, I, I believe. No, I completely agree. Hey, um, so appreciate you joining uh, to talk about this campaign in this book. Uh, Three Commando Brigade in the Falklands, No Picnic uh, by Julian Thompson, a, a great book, uh, you know, and I think one of these uh, that, that I've read a couple times uh, to, to help me think about large-scale combat operations against near-peer uh, adversaries. Um, what, what I'd like to close with is, you know, you're, you're finishing up your time at the Joint Readiness Training Center here at Fort Johnson. What, uh, what have you learned from this experience and what advice would you give uh, leaders preparing uh, for, for this kind of training event? So, I've learned a lot, uh, far more than I can just say in 30 seconds now, but the, the importance of patrolling, we've mentioned it before, I think it's worth mentioning again, that is the thing that will stick with me when I go out of here and then one day go back and hopefully do company command. Uh, that race to find uh, is, is, is very important. The importance of review, when you come through and do uh, collective training, review kind of happens to you. But when you go away from collective training, you've got, you've got to schedule the time to review yourselves. Uh, because ultimately, I, I believe that, that ability for us to uh, candidly review is the ability that will enable us to win any campaign uh, that we may go on in the future. Because we may not win the first battle, but if we can honestly look back at it and reflect and identify the issues and solve the issues, we'll have a much better chance of, of winning the second battle. So we have to inculcate that into our ethos and culture. Um, and I, I believe, I firmly believe we've got some of the best people um, in, in the world, really. We've got some really, really intelligent, motivated people who care, they look after their soldiers, um, and I'm sure that collectively, if we, if we turn our mind to any of these problems, we'll, we'll be able to solve whatever comes ahead of us. And then the last bit of advice I'd say to anyone coming through on JSC is don't forget to enjoy it. Um, there's, there's no other job like it in the world. And we mentioned you'll forge relationships and friendships and uh, create memories that you'll probably carry with you for the rest of your life. Um, it's, it's great fun. Um, and one day you'll be too old to do it and you'll look back and think actually it wasn't that bad. So. Yeah. I think that's well, well, thanks for joining us and, and uh, you know I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit on a couple of those. you know so I think this um, you know winning is, is this, I mean we're in a profession that is existential. I mean what we do uh, determines whether or not you know the fates of nations and whether or not people live or die. And so um, you know learning or organizations that learn fastest win. And um, it, I think it takes a tremendous amount of humility to do what you describe, which is to accurately look at yourself and say, okay, hey, here's where we're at, honestly, right now, and this is the work in front of us. And I think, I think that's the true mark of, of professionals and, and units that do it before they come here and units that do it during and units that do it after rotation uh, experience the most growth. And you know, at the end of the day, um, this isn't the World Cup, so it's my shout out to to my, my allies out there, this this is the train up before the World Cup, yeah. you know, before before the big match, and so we, we've really got to have a mindset of like, we're going to get the most out of this experience to prepare ourselves for what could be the worst day of our life going forward. Um, you know, the patrolling, 
it, it's that's the secret sauce of Geronimo. I mean, it's what they do. They yeah. constantly maintain contact. Yep. Um, and, and they're going to do it through, uh, you know, EW sensors. They're going to do it with small UAS. And they, and when the weather goes bad, they've always got patrols out. Yep. And they're always dismounted and, and moving around and, and seeking to confirm or deny enemy locations. Um, yeah. You know. They don't let you breathe out there. They don't let you no. breathe. They give you no space. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, I was fortunate. I got to do uh, a rotation down in Australia, their CTC, oh, and it, it was uh, we'd flown 18 hours in flight rig, uh, jumped from uh, Alaska into Australia. I'd always wanted to go to Australia, and I, Shoalwater Bay is no different than uh, than Fort Johnson, JRTC. It, it just has kangaroos instead of wild horses. <laughs> um, and you know no vehicles and after walking uh through the swamps there and crossing a couple rivers i was i was feeling a little bit sorry for myself and yeah, my I'm battalion sergeant bet. major sergeant major hansen you know looks over at me at two in the morning with a giant grin on his face and was like isn't this amazing yeah we'll never get to do this again yeah and i think you're exactly right it's embracing the moment and and uh and, and really treasuring uh, shared hardship yeah. uh, which is is tough when you're in it uh, but not only makes memories, but, but really has a generational impact uh, going forward. So appreciate uh, your time uh, here today with me, but more importantly, you know, what you've done for the U.S. Army and what you've done really for your, for your own military, um, you know, growing in the profession uh, going forward. So thanks for being well, here. Well, thank you very much for having me, sir. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for joining us on The Crucible, the JRTC Experience. The Joint Readiness Training Center is the premier crucible training experience. We prepare units to fight and win in the most complex environments against world-class opposing forces. We are America's leadership laboratory. Again, we'd like to thank our guests for participating. This podcast was created and produced by Mr. John Mabes. It was recorded and edited by Chief Thomas Rich and researched by First Lieutenant Anthony Cho. Intro vocals were done by Mr. Robert Chopper. Special thanks to Captain Jermaine Branch and Mr. Jeff England from Public Affairs. Be sure to like and follow us on social media to keep up with the latest warfighting TTPs learned through the crucible that is the Joint Readiness Training Center. Follow us by going to https colon forward slash forward slash l-i-n-k-t-r dot ee forward slash jrtc we'd like to thank our partners at the center for army lessons learned of the combined arms center especially the jrtc call observations detachment be sure to follow them on social media as well follow them at https colon forward slash forward slash www dot army dot mil forward slash c-a-l-l don't forget to like subscribe and review us wherever you listen or watch your podcasts and be sure to stay tuned for more in the near future the crucible the jrtc experience is a product of the joint readiness training center